Welcome back. We are in chapter 14 and we're going to be covering social psychology in the clinic. And so this is going to cover health and psychological factors that can contribute to health. So let's get started. So before we start talking about the big concepts, let's do a little self-test. And obviously I can't see your answers, but it would be in your best interest to go ahead and mark down your your response for each of the questions or the examples so that then ultimately you can do compute a mean score. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, so compare. So what I want you to be thinking about in, in your head is comparing yourself to other students who are your same sex. So what you're trying to think of is someone who's like you. What do you think are the chances that the following health problems will trouble you at some point in the future? So you're thinking of people who are like you in basic age and sex compared to them. What do you think your chances are that you would have one of these health problems? And you can respond on a scale from negative three, which is much below average, to positive three, which is much above average. And anything between, if you think you're just average on the risk, then you'll give yourself a zero. If you think you're below average, you'll give something negative, one, two, or three. If you think you're above average on that, then you'll give yourself something positive, one, two, or three. Okay, so hopefully that makes decent sense. All right, and then here are the things I want you to think about. Arthritis. So compared to other people of your same age and sex, what is the likelihood that you would develop arthritis relative to these other people who are similar to you? Two, suicide. Three, pneumonia. Four, being 40 or more pounds overweight. Five is laryngitis. Six is alcoholism. Seven is being killed in a car accident. And eight is lung cancer. So you can pause me if you need to think about these more de in more detail. All right, so hopefully we're back. So once you've got a response for each of these eight items, your next job is to calculate your mean score. So that means add, all up, add up all of your ratings and divide by eight. So go ahead and do that. And remember, if you're dividing a negative number by a positive number, that produces a negative number. If you're dividing a positive number by a positive number, that produces a positive. So go ahead and do that calculation. Pause me if you need to. All right. Now, normally I ask people to raise their hands in class, but I can't see you. So um, whose average is below zero? Almost everybody raises their hand on that. Almost everybody thinks that their risk on average of these different things, you know, and, and maybe some of them you've had. And so, you know, you know, you're above average or, or maybe you think you're average because you have had it or whatever. Even with that being present, most people, not just students, not just you, but most people think that they have a lower likelihood of experiencing these kinds of outcomes, these health related outcomes than somebody who is their same basic age and sex. It's what we call unrealistic optimism. We tend to believe that, you know, arthritis, I can somehow avoid that, right? That gaining weight, I can somehow avoid that. You know, there, that there are things that we can do to avoid our, these um, possible outcomes. And we think maybe we could do it better than the average person could. And so on average, we tend to display this unrealistic optimism. Now, to a certain extent, we're kind of right. I mean, health behaviors um, are really important for us to engage in, right? Because major health problems are mostly preventable diseases. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to pause because my dogs are going nuts. All right, I'm back. So major health problems are largely pre preventable diseases. Um, that we have a lot of lifestyle choices that contribute to the onset of disease. Um, one of the things we talk about in great detail in my lifespan development class is that the things that are ultimately going to um, produce disease in us in our later years are the seeds for those outcomes are sown in our 20s. You know, the over drinking, the lack of exercise that we might be engaging in, um, the poor diet, things like that. We start the process of sort of decline in our 20s, but we don't really start to see the outcome of that, those choices that we made in our 20s until we're in our 40s, 50s, or 60s, right? And so these lifestyle choices 
are ones that we need to start early. They need to be habits that we engage in from the time that we're young. Um, we need to stick with them even as we age, things like that. A lot of the uh, most common killers, which are heart disease um, and, and it's related, related cardiovascular problems and then um, lung disease, those things are largely attributable to day-to-day -day choices that we make with regard to exercise, diet, you know, smoking or not, those kinds of things. Um, let me get my arrow back. There we go. All right. So health behaviors is the general term that we use to describe actions that are undertaken by healthy people to enhance or maintain their good health, right? Um, so health is a function of a whole bunch of things. The kind of food that we eat, exercising, avoiding substance abuse, not necessarily all, you know, lack of use, but abuse to the point where it's, um, harmful, um, getting enough sleep, controlling our weight, using sunscreen whenever we're out in the sun, practicing safe sex all the time, and um, getting health screening tests so that if, if there is something, then it can be caught earlier when it's more treatable. So we have all these factors that can all contribute to health. And, you know, in all these factors, there's nothing that you can't avoid, right? These are things that these are lifestyle choices that people can make that can help to protect their good health. Um, we don't always do them though, right? Like, do we always eat healthy food? Mm, I think we're all, all allowed, you know, some degree of not perfect eating, but you know, the, the pattern should be largely healthy food, right? Um, do we exercise every single day? Maybe you're allowed a couple of days off, but we're probably supposed to exercise to some extent every day, right? Um, you know, avoiding substance abuse. A lot of us, especially in college, we avoid sleeping, right? We we're, There are just so many things to do. We have to work or we have to go to school. We have, you know, maybe there's a party. There's like just so many things to fit into a day that we're like, yeah, I'll sleep later, right? Um, but you're setting patterns that, you know, maybe your body can bounce back from it while you're 18 to 25 years old. But then, you know, it starts to accumulate on you as you get older. And so um, one of the things that can happen is you can start to put on weight if you're not getting enough sleep, right? Um, all of these things can all kind of work together to, to you know, undermine health or to, to enhance health. The more health behaviors a person engages in, the more energy they tend to feel and display and the fewer illnesses they tend to experience. And I'm not just talking about like long-term ones that might appear in our 60s. I'm talking about day-to-day -day kinds of illnesses like colds and flus and things like that. Um, so the more health behaviors a person engages in, the more they actually protect their health. Um, it, they boost their immune systems, um, things like that. And so, and in fact, the more health behaviors you engage in, the more energy you have to, to follow through in, you know, some of the specific health behaviors like exercising. So um, it all works together to, to preserve our, our health. Attitudes really affect our health behaviors. Um, if we value, this is a lot of things that all come together. So <laughs> brace yourself for a long list here. If we value health and we have a perception of threat from disease, if we believe that if we don't preserve our health, um, we would become vulnerable to disease. And we carry a self-efficacy, a, a self-efficacious or, you know, high self-efficacy attitude where we, we believe that we could engage in the behaviors that would protect our health. And we do believe in our own vulnerability. I, if we, if we think that it's possible that we, something bad could happen to us and we, display high response efficacy where we believe that if we were to do the behavior, it would actually help. All of those things put together combine to produce engagement in healthy behaviors. I mentioned in an earlier chapter, um, you know, when HIV first came on the scene and the government's response was don't have sex. Um, it was very like, that was not a helpful message because that's sort of that's a tough one to tell people not to ever have sex. Um, it wasn't until social psychologists got involved and really developed those three items in a row that have the plus signs between it, valuing health, the perception of, of threat from the disease, and your belief in your own vulnerability to the disease, that we were actually able to convince people that um, there is something you can do and help to build their self-efficacy, that they could do the behavior and that that behavior would work. Right. So the government had done a really good job of scaring everybody, right? The perception that the, that the disease was a threat. Um, people, 
um, between eight, 1988 and 1995, they really believe that if you catch HIV, you're dead within a few years and, and you're going to spread it around to everybody. And, and it's, you know, there was a, a big perception of threat. So we had that. There was to some degree a belief in an individual's own vulner vulnerability. Early on in the pandemic, the uh, belief was that it only affected gay men and Haitians. And there were like these subsets. It was a very discriminatory message that was first sent about who was vulnerable to HIV. But it only took, well, I should say only. I mean, you guys saw how long this last year lasted. So five years is actually a long time, but it only took about five years before the messaging completely switched. And we all realized that it was a sexually transmitted infection and in an IV drug use transmission um, disease. And so anybody is vulnerable to it. And so, um, you know, pretty quickly, the message that it was a threat and that anybody was vulnerable really took hold to the point where people were kind of panicking and they thought they could get it all sorts of different ways and all sorts of things. When the social psychologists stepped in, they were really focusing in on the self the self-efficacy part of it. There are things you can do to prevent, uh, you know, transmitting if you have it or um, contracting HIV. There are things you can do and response efficacy. That behavior will work. So there was there were big campaigns about using condoms for every sexual contact and for using a clean needle for every IV drug injection. And clean needle programs were instituted and things like that. Um, and it helped really to to reduce transmission. People using condoms and people using clean needles really reduce transmission. Today, the most common method of transmission is IV drug use because so many people are using condoms so regularly. We have a, a blip going on right now with um, gay men being less willing to use condoms. They're relying really heavily on PrEP, which is really expensive, or the assumption that um, being on an HIV cocktail would prevent a person from transmitting it. And so there's a little bit of um, wishful thinking going on right now, uh, but hopefully we can convince that subpopulation to, to start using condoms again for every sexual contact and we can um, really uh, reduce transmission again. But the idea that there's something you can do and it will work was a new idea. Starting in about 1995, that became the new method of um, informing the public. You don't want to get this disease. You could get this disease from very benign behaviors, but this is what you can do to protect yourself. And that message really changed people's behavior. Um, and so with uh, COVID, we're seeing the same kind of, you know, the initial response was it's a threat. Everybody's equally vulnerable and there's nothing you can do. You have to hide in your house, right? Like that was the initial response. And then um, there were messages about things that could be done, right? Self-efficacy, right? There are things that you can do to reduce transmission. You can wear a mask when you go out in public, um, you know, but there was now this debate over whether masks work. There was a, the exact same debate over whether condoms work for HIV. The exact same logic was being used. Um, the pores in a condom are in fact larger than an HIV virus. I didn't want to say the word virus again because V and HIV stands for virus. So I just said HIV virus virus. But anyway, um, the pores in condoms are in fact larger than HIV. So if you use your condom incorrectly, there is an opportunity for HIV to pass through a condom. But if you use it correctly, there is not because as soon as ejaculation occurs, sorry, this isn't human sexuality, you're supposed to remove that condom away from um, the recipient, right? So it never should happen if you're using a condom correctly. Similarly, if you're using uh, masks correctly, even though obviously um, COVID molecules are smaller than the pores in a cloth mask, um, usually COVID molecules are encased in fluid and so they will catch on the mask. And so if you're staying away from each other and you both have masks on, the likelihood that it would transmit between two people, and especially if you have, you know, better masks, like even homemade ones that are made with two layers are better masks. I've seen homemade masks where they just put a coffee filter in there and that's better because that paper will actually capture the, the fluid. Um, so that's better. And so two people with masks on, um, the likelihood like that the behavior will work is really high, right? And it's in our best interest to do it. Um, but we got bogged down in the argument about whether masks are objectively good enough for straining out 
a virus instead of just taking the the um, step of doing it. My family still laughs at me because I still wear a mask all the time. And my, you know, my husband's vaccinated and everything. And, um, you know, don't wear a mask. You don't have to be wearing a mask. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to still wear a mask. <laughs> like, Call me neurotic. I'm just doing this. And, uh, you know, I've spent a year pretty much in the house because I teach from home and all these things. And so I don't go out very much anyway, um, because, you know, just the way my life is structured and uh, so I do my little thing. It makes me feel like I'm doing something that w that I know works. And so why not? You know, it doesn't harm me. I made my own little masks. They've got extra layers in it, um, stuff like that anyway. So these attitudes, this messaging that um, it gets bogged down in the media and in people's debates about it. Um, but ultimately, we can see that people actually change their behaviors and people actually will engage in more healthy behaviors if they feel like the behavior that we're asking them to do is something that they're willing to and can do and that the behavior will actually work. And so right now what we're struggling with, this is, I'm making this recording in July of 2021. And um, the current debate is, you know, those last few people who haven't gotten vaccinated yet. And at the same time that we're sort of berating people who haven't gotten vaccinated yet, we're getting new data from like the UK that is finding that, you know, 40% of people who are being hospitalized for COVID right now in, in the UK have been fully vaccinated. And so um, some people are starting to question whether the behavior will work. Like if I get vaccinated, is it actually going to keep me out of the hospital? Is it actually going to keep me from catching or transmitting COVID. And so we're sort of bogging down in real time right now with these debates. I just want to reassure you that these exact same things happen with HIV back in the 1990 to 1995 period, as you know, the, the, the strategies were coming, were emerging, things that could actually reduce transmission. People were questioning them, arguing about them, um, saying it doesn't matter, um, a bunch of different things, just like you're hearing today. So I just, I'm saying that as a sort of an optimistic message that um, ultimately it'll settle out and you'll be like my my students prior to COVID, when, whenever we would talk about these, these issues about HIV in my human sexuality class, the students would be sort of like, I can't believe people were reacting like that. It's such a panicky way to react. And uh, so over the top, and, um, you know, it doesn't seem like the way that we would react today. And then here we have virtually the same messages coming out of the government and then coming out of the, you know, these self-efficacy messages and response efficacy messages, you know, all of these things are being provided and people are reacting exactly the same way, having the same kinds of debates that we did, you know, 30 years ago with HIV. So I don't think we're, we've modernized that much. Um, but if you think about with regard to other behaviors, smoking or um, healthy eating, things like that, you can see that this flow chart, you can see how that would contribute to healthy behaviors. It, you know, yes, I can eat healthy, but it, will it really matter in the long run? Maybe I have just a genetic predisposition towards, you know, obesity or something. And so, you know, you could see a person kind of going through um, that efficacy, those two types of efficacy to really help them to determine whether it's worth their while to try and implement those healthy behaviors. All right. Well, that was enough on that. Let's go ahead and uh, take a break and we will come back and talk about behaviors that can contribute to health. 